Thank you. Bill Alcoholic, where's my tech guy? Here's my tech guy. My roadie. Wow. I didn't know he was stalking me on Facebook. I quit posting stuff there, you know? But there's lots of Russian girls that are interested in me. I'm big in Russia. Well, what a weekend, huh? Heard some great talks, man. Everybody's on their game. Now we get to relax a little bit. I'm up here. and No heavy stuff. And, uh, um, I was here in uh, 2019 with uh, Charlie and Katie Parker. I really miss Charlie Parker. Um, he was my friend. And it brings back memories. There's Charlie and Katie and me and uh, Earl Hightower and uh, Candace Moore. Whoa. And uh, <laughs> everybody was on their game. I was standing there talking to them one point, and I said, boy, it's a good thing we're not competitive. <laughs> you know, I feel very competitive this weekend, so you have no idea what you're going to get now. I was up in my room just before this making up new stuff. Uh, uh, you'll notice that they didn't give me a step to talk on. I guess they figured I wasn't qualified. <laughs> Matthew had props. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> I was looking for a PowerPoint machine during the break. Uh, <laughs> I love AA. I love the energy of this place. You get to go around to a bunch of these things, and sometimes the energy is better in other places than others. Sometimes there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy here. You know. the people from South Carolina need to cheer down a little bit, you know. You know, you know. <laughs> oh man. So I got to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was thirty seven years old. And I was pooped. Yeah. I think a lot of us just fall over from the sheer exhaustion of the lifestyle. You know, sometimes you just run it into the ground. And, uh, and I was tired. I was on my second marriage, my second set of two kids. Uh, I got two kids in Eugene, Oregon that are in their mid-50s. You know, and uh, I didn't know I was that old. Uh, so the second marriage, I, my little daughter was three years old and my son was four months old. And uh, I was up all night. You ever been up all night? Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's very many things that are more depressing than when that sun comes up. And... Uh, I mean, there's certain spiritual truths, and one of them is alcohol plus money equals cocaine. Yes. <laughs> this is not an outside issue. God gave alcoholics cocaine so we could drink more. That's what it's for. Cliff agrees with that. You know, there's people that just do cocaine all by itself. What a weird people. 
They have their own program, you know. They really miss the point of the whole thing. So I'm up all night, the sun comes up, and this is not a happy moment. By this time in my life, I'm a vampire. I operate at night. Because when the sun comes up, you know what it's going to be is another miserable day in a long, long line of miserable days. And my little three-year-old daughter got up, and she was really happy to see that Daddy was up. And she came running out in the living room and crawled up in my lap, and it just broke my heart. Sometimes there's those moments, aren't there? It just cuts through the haze, and uh, it just broke my heart. So like any good gangster, I called my mom. (laughs) This is a woman that had been in Al-Anon for 30 years by this time. They are organized, (laughs) prepared, and focused. And uh, she came and got me inside of a half an hour before I took a nap and changed my mind. And uh, you see, my story is, by the time I was 17, I was a bad drunk in high school. I had a big jacket and a slouch and a sneer and a foul mouth and a bad attitude, and I carried a gun. And I'm from the mean streets of Palace Verdes. <laughs> There's no gangs in Palace Verdes. No one was looking for me. I was a gang of one. Right. And... Uh, My story is I was a surfer and a biker and a tough guy. And I rarely went to the beach. My motorcycle rarely ran, and I was afraid to fight. (laughs) But I looked really good. I had a chrome Nazi helmet for a hat and a primary chain for a belt, black greasy Levi's, big black boots with chains around them. I've got tattoos all over me. But I had a clip-on earring because I didn't want to hurt myself. (laughs) My biker nickname was Horny. (laughs) I have it tattooed here on my arm, and it's misspelled. (laughs) It's H-O-R-N-E-Y. Horny. with an exclamation mark for emphasis. After the meeting for five bucks, I'll show it to you. Me and the two other rocket scientists were there, figured that's how you spell it. My wife, Karen, my third wife, the the favorite one of all my wives, uh, she's the one that told me it's misspelled. She noticed it right away. (laughs) I argued with her. (laughs) So that's pretty much all you need to know about me. It was the 60s, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and the road from Los Angeles to Golden Gate Park to San Francisco was the road to Nirvana, 
Golden Gate Park was the center of the universe. The young ladies were discovering their sexuality. We were helping them as best we could. <laughs> they weren't eating hitchhikers yet, so it was safe to travel. You know? This is back in the good old days. And uh, I met her, and she lived up in Oregon, so we went up there to grow our own. And, uh, and we did. <laughs> and, uh, and I got there to Oregon, and I started running around with an outlaw motorcycle gang, and I'm sticking needles in my arm every day and drinking like a fish and not coming home to that family and those two little boys. And they were on welfare, and it was awful. We, you know why we laugh about those stories? Because it's not like that anymore. When it's like that, it's not funny. You know, somebody shared alcoholism isn't cute. And, uh, and I ended up in the Oregon State Mental Institution. <laughs> I needed a rest. <laughs> it's rough out there changing the world, you know? And, uh, the mental institution I was on is the mental institution. The ward I was on was a ward that Ken Kesey worked on when he wrote Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. They filmed that movie on the ward I was on. Next time you see that movie, think of me. <laughs> now, I'm not bragging. It's just all I got. <laughs> Some people went to college and, you know, I couldn't find the place, you know, and, uh, some years ago, I spoke up at a little conference in Salem, Oregon, and I went to try to find my alma mater, and uh, <laughs> I'm having dinner next to this long-haired hippie dude that came up from California about the same time I did, and he stayed up there, and he was one of the speakers. And I told him, I was in the mental institution here. He goes, oh, I work there. I went, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and he says, would you like to go? I said, yeah. So he called up security, and he said, we've got a dignitary from the South. <laughs> you know? And I found my ward had my picture taken next to the sign, and you know, a couple of years later, I'm speaking up in Portland, and a bunch of guys from Salem drove up to Portland and uh, gave me a little prize. They gave me a, a T-shirt that says "Oregon State Mental Hospital Alumni." So if I remember correctly, I think the whole idea behind the drinking thing, because we all talk about how we felt not part of and separate and outside the circle and all that. Sometimes we talk about I had alcoholic thinking long before I drank, as if there is such a thing as alcoholic thinking. We would like to think that we're kind of uniquely neurotic, but I don't think that's true. I don't think we're that special. We just have an issue with drinking you know, and uh, but we all talk about that feeling of separation, and then we drink, and we have a unifying experience. We have a spiritual awakening. You know, if other people got the kick out of it that we got, they would drink more, but they don't. You know, they just get stupid and silly and try and get laid and puke. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> but we're you like changing the world. You know, things. Like, so I think the whole idea behind the drinking thing was to have a couple of pops and get out of the house and go have some fun. I ended up naked in my living room watching religious television, taking notes. <laughs> I'm having sex, menage a uno. <laughs> There's no one else in the room, right? <laughs> well, we're partying with Bill now. It's getting serious. <laughs> you know? I love the story with Cliff barricading himself in his, in his little office in the house, you know, with the porn and the... <laughs> <laughs> and the white powder and the, out, the party. We're, we're partying now, boy. We're tearing it up, you know. It's like, you know. Next time somebody walks into one of your meetings and says, I'm just a party kind of guy, ask him, how many other people were at the party you just left? <laughs> you know. If there was still a party, we'd still be out there, wouldn't we? Uh, the party ended a long, long time ago for me. And... Uh, so my sober dad, who got sober in 1954 in AA, uh, I went back down to California, state of Oregon, asked me to leave, please. And, uh, and I left, and I came back down, and he let me sleep in his garage, and he gave me a job in his little machine shop in El Segundo, California. And I tried to clean up my act. And 15 years after the mental institution, I lived in the house with this second wife and, and the kids, and I had no emotional connection to another living human being. 
And I didn't know that. We don't know that, do we? The alcoholic life seems like the only normal one. That's our experience. We figure probably everybody else feels similar to us. No, they don't. You know, they don't. And uh, so my mother came and picked me up and took me to this place in Costa Mesa called Starting Point, and I spent 35 days in there. And while I was in there, they made me wear a sign around my neck. I had to make the sign. We made it in crafts. It's a little rectangular piece of cardboard with a string that went through it, and it said, I am not a counselor. Because <laughs> evidently there was some confusion about that. And, uh... Then after 35 days, they let me out. They just let us out, don't they? Like we're okay. <laughs> Go forth, multiply. You know. <laughs> and where do we end up? The Appalachia Regional Roundup. You know? <laughs> the world's aftercare program, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, this is where we end up. This is literally the last house on the street. There's nowhere else for us to go. You ever walked out one of your clubhouses pissed off at somebody and you're heading across the parking lot and you say to yourself, where are you going, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I actually did that. Yeah. And uh, I, there's nowhere else to go. So after, after the 35 days in there, and I was very ill, and I was a lot sicker than I thought I was, as it turned out. I had bad cirrhosis. It was a lot worse, as I found out later. And I had hepatitis C, and they didn't call it that then. They just called it non-A, non-B, and didn't think it was any big deal. Boy, were they wrong about that. And uh, seven years ago, last month in February, I had a liver transplant at 30 years sober. Every year I call the surgeon, and this year he actually responded to me. He says, I remember you. <laughs> and I thanked him for saving my life, and I told him I'm 38 years sober. And I went to the Galapagos Islands and the Amazon, and I went through, you know, I'm living a good life. I feel pretty good. I'm 76 years old, and I'm not dead. <laughs> you know? Every time I... <laughs> Every time I start whining about something, because I have old age stuff, right? My wife just laughs at me and leaves the room, you know? <laughs> like, Jesus, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm not dead, and I'm here with you. And I've always, always been able to tap into this energy. You know, you get tired of the airports, you get tired, you know, so you get tired, you get, you know, you slow down a bit, but when you get here and, like, you ever, you ever walked into a room before a meeting and everybody's talking and nobody's listening and just sit there and close your eyes and feel the energy in the room? And right now, we're in a room full of people, most of whom are conscious of the fact that their life has been saved. That's a real energy. You can feel that, you know. You know, we, we're in a program where we laugh at the tragedies and cry at the successes. In the same row in one of your meetings, or maybe even here, there's a bank president, a bank teller, and a bank robber. <laughs> you know? And the robber might sponsor the president. You know? <laughs> you know? That's where we are. You know? You know? My sponsor told me when I had have a resentment against somebody, somebody wasn't treating me right or something, he says, he says uh, do you know that guy's story? I said, well, no, not specifically. He says, you ought to find it. It's a wonder he can string sentences together, much less behave correctly, you know. And I, I never consider that. I just judge you, and I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know. But now I don't do that so much anymore. I don't know what your story is sometimes. And uh, so the, there's two things that happened to me that's just pure luck when I walked into AA. The first day I got out of this place was on a Friday in April. 
of 85. My sobriety date is March the 27th, 1985. And uh, so I'm coming up. It's just a few days, so I wanted to stand up at 39. But it's only 38, you know, but technicalities, you know what I mean? And because uh, I'm very impressed by that. That's a hell of a long time, you know. Did you know you were going to be here as long as you've been here? Yeah. Did you have any idea when you walked into AA that it was going to be fun? I sure didn't. I didn't think it was going to be fun, you know. But God, I've had a good time in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just an amazing time. And, uh, but I walked into this room at the Hermosa Beach Alano Club in late April of 1985. It was a beautiful summer, summer, summer day, and, and I walked up right on time because who knew that an AA meeting would be full on a Friday night down by the beach in Cal- Southern California? And all the Harleys were parked out front, which I wasn't expecting. And I walked into the back of that room, and it was the gong show. It was a meeting called the gong show. And everybody was dressed up trying to hook up, right? This was not the AA meetings I went to in the 50s with Dad, you know. <laughs> this was something else. They, something had changed, right? And I walked in. I stood in the back of the room, and nicknames are flying around. One guy got up to the podium, and they hooted at him so much, he just sat back down. You know, evidently a well-loved guy in this group, you know. And I got, the lucky thing is, I just liked it right from the start. I mean, I was confused by it, but I was intrigued. I started laughing. You know, I got the joke. And not even, when you, when you start laughing in AA, you caught alcoholism, you know. <laughs> That's how you find out whether you got it. If you think it's funny, because down at the Rotary Club, they are not laughing at this stuff. You know, you know it just, they don't get it. And I started laughing, and I left that meeting that night, and in the car driving home, I thought, this may not be so bad. I am an old hippie from the 60s. Weird has always attracted me. I used to have hair. Weird has always attracted me. And to this day, I find you all deliciously strange, you know, <laughs> just intriguing, you know. And a little dangerous, you know, just a little. And, uh, and I went back the next night just to find out what was going on. I was intrigued. The second lucky thing that happened to me is I asked this guy to help me, and he actually did, which doesn't always happen. You know, we heard a lot about that this weekend. We heard a lot about working with others and the steps and the inventory and all that stuff, and I, I, I want to talk about that. I asked this guy to help me, and standing outside the Ilana Club, and one of the things he said to me that night was, I want you to go home and read the doctor's opinion, make notes in the margin of what you agree with and what you don't, be at my house Thursday at 5 o'clock, and we'll discuss it. So we hit bottom here, right? We hit bottom, we come into A. We hit, I've hit bottoms in sobriety. And I think what a bottom is is the collapse of the alibi system, right? Because the way we justify the alcoholic life is we make it someone else's fault. We have a whole story that we've been telling ourselves, and we actually believe the story, you know, that justifies our behavior. And I think that alibi system collapses, and a window of opportunity w- opens up. But it closes. Chris talked about that. It closes. You know, you wait long enough, it'll close up, and the alibi system comes roaring, because that's all we got to work with. But when that thing opens up, there's an opportunity here. And for some odd reason that night when this little guy said that to me, I just did what he told me. I didn't argue with him. I just went home and I read my assignment. And I told him in the recovery place we'd already read the book so we could move on. He, I actually, I actually said that. And I've already done all that shit, man. You know, it's like, and uh, he didn't seem to care about that. And he said, well, you're on the street now. Do this. So I did it. And I showed up at his house Thursday at five o'clock and he didn't trust me that I'd read it. And he had me sit there and read it to him out loud. And he explained some things to me. One of the things he said to me, it might have been at the first or second meeting, he said, my job as your sponsor is to guide you through the process of these 12 steps that you might have some kind of a spiritual awakening and maybe you'll never drink again for the rest of your life because that happens here. He said, I'd be happy to sit here and listen to you tell me what you think your problems are so that you will not share about them in the meetings. 
The meetings for recovery from alcoholism, not about how your day went. You heard some of that this weekend. And I told him, I said, down there at that Alano Club, they are breaking that rule right and left. <laughs> Should we go tell them? He says, no, AA is a safe place. You, they can't kick you out. You can do it. I'm just describing to you my Alcoholics Anonymous. And I still believe that today. <laughs> and, uh, you ever notice how there's so many people in AA that are sober incorrectly? <laughs> it's pretty impressive, you know. And, uh, Each week I went to his house and we worked another, we read another chapter in the book. And at six months sober, I did an inventory. I did a fourth and a fifth step. And uh, I had one of those experiences that we have around here that we try to describe, or we try to explain. We, you don't really understand what's going on, but we try to explain. And what it was is he told me, go be quiet for an hour and reflect on what you've done. And, you know, and, and, and when you go home today, think about the guy that walked through that door six months ago compared to the guy that's walking through it today. And I did that. I stopped on the doorstep and I thought about it and it struck me. It's going to be like this now. Evidently, the old life, whatever that was, is over. Isn't that remarkable? That was the first moment I can recall where I began to realize that something quite remarkable happened to me on March the 27th, 1985 that something touched me and took the obsession away. And it has never returned. But it takes a while to re realize that, doesn't it? I mean, you're busy just trying to... I'm the, I'm the guy when I'm new and I walk in the room and if you're looking at me, it's what the hell are you looking at? And if you don't look at me, I'm heartbroken. <laughs> there are not levels of emotional development here. The switch is either on or off. Right? And it's all about me all the time. And I believe that what we suffer from is emotional immaturity. I don't think we're that uniquely neurotic. I think we just drank through that period in our lives, and we're going to grow up now, and the chances of us doing that and looking good are really slim. <laughs> I was eight years sober, fast-tracked to being an AA guru, speaking around, and I'm on a soccer field with a bunch of nine-year-olds, which include my kids, and I got escorted off the soccer field for going after the referee. <laughs> and I'll tell you, when you're eight years sober, and they're es escorting you off the soccer field, you know you screwed up. <laughs> and I, the thought is, oh, God, I did it again. I overreacted again. I was coaching a bunch of nine-year-olds in a middle school, and at half, they were losing like six to nothing. And I gave him a lecture on personal pride. And I said, you can't allow yourself to be crushed like this. You've got to start knocking people over. You can't just like, Mr. Cleveland said we could hit people. <laughs> they went back out there. They scored two more goals against them. And I w w just walked off the field and left them. And I had my Harley parked in the basketball courts because I'm a badass. And I got on the motorcycle and fired up and burned rubber through the basketball course and just left them there. And then I ran out of gas. True story. I walked home. It wasn't far from the house. I walked home and uh, called my sponsor and told him what had happened. And he said, Bill, it's children's sports. And I said, you don't understand. <laughs> I'm 45 years old, I'm, you know, and that's how I'm acting. Like a teenager, isn't it? Like a teenager. All my reactions are overreactions. And I know better, I just can't help myself. There's something, there's a rage within me. You know, that, and I can't help myself with that. But you have to, I have to walk back out on that soccer field and make amends. 
I have to go find those kids. I got to find the other parents and apologize. I did that so much that one of the soccer coaches for my daughter's club team said, Bill, why don't you cut it out? We're tired of the apologies. But that's all I got to work with. All I can do is recognize that it's my problem and make those amends, and hopefully someday it'll be lifted from me. We heard about six and seven, you know. I'm willing. I rarely humbly ask, though, because I'm still in charge, right? I'm still in charge, evidently. So, six months sober, I did an inventory, and I had that experience. A few years ago, some years ago, I was sitting with an Indian guru, and I was very impressed to be with this guy. A friend of mine was attached to him, and we went up uh, to hear him speak somewhere. And after his talk, we went back into this little back room of this place, and it was just the three of us sitting there. And I'm talking away like I do because I'm nervous. I'm kind of excited. I'm talking away. And this old Indian guy starts laughing at me because that's what they do. They laugh at us. And... uh, I said, what are you laughing at? And he goes, I just love you alcoholic and drug addicts. I go, why is that? He goes, well, the rest of them out there are trying to get awakened. You're just trying to figure out what the hell happened. (laughs) Isn't that true? Like, what are we doing here? Are we supposed to be here? I, I wonder about that sometimes. How did we end up here? This was never the plan, was it? Was this a plan for you? Certainly wasn't for me to be sitting here with you, you know, in Tennessee. (laughs) You know, it's pretty odd. Something touched me. Something changed the course of my very life. You heard a little history of the amends that Matthew did. It's great. And all you need to know about Bill Wilson's spiritual experience or ours is he was never the same after that. Ever. Ever. Right. This is a Wall Street speculator, not a broker. He's a speculator, highly educated, right-wing Republican of the day. And he, he hated Franklin Roosevelt. He thought he was a communist. <laughs> it's like, you know, he was a capitalist, like the classic capitalist rising up. He created the most socialist organization in the world. <laughs> That's a spiritual awakening, you know? you know. How do you get from there to there, you know? I think it's quite remarkable, you know? I started sponsoring, guys. I started making amends. I love the amends story, don't you? So when the pandemic hit, I'm sitting in my office speaking on Zoom, wondering what's going to happen now. You know, everything's changing, right? It was a stunning experience. I think the whole Zoom thing has given the world more access to Alcoholics Anonymous than it's ever had. You know, you know. I mean, but initially it was, a, it was pretty strange. You know, what was, we weren't sure what was going to happen. All the tech dudes stepped up and we're on Zoom within a week. You know, we're, we're doing it. And uh, so they're asking you to speak seven days a week. It's like, you know, everybody can get you for free. You know, and I'm getting to, I can't keep this up. I'm, even I'm tired of hearing me, you know. And uh, so I, I, I thought about what was going on. I thought about some stuff, and I thought, what can I start talking about now? What's been my experience? And I made some notes. I wrote some stuff down. And I'd like to share with you what I came up with. See what you think about it. It says in our book, in the 10th step, page 80-something, and uh, <laughs> and. Uh, It says that the only thing that's going to save us, keep us sober, give us a life with some purpose, maybe some intimacy, the only thing that's going to save us is the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And we have these things called laurels. You've got to look that up. A laurel is a past achievement. That's one definition. Well, I didn't have a spiritual condition, and I had no past achievements. So as a newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous, i got a job to do. i got to get a spiritual condition that hopefully includes some laurels so that later on I can rest on them and find out why that's not a good idea. (laughs) This is not going to happen right away. It's going to take a while, right? And it certainly has for me. 
But what the first thing that this guy wanted to know from me when I went into his house that day when we read the doctor's opinion is whether or not I thought I was powerless over drugs and alcohol. And for me, that was an easy answer. I was pooped. And I just knew I was going to drink again because I always had. But by this time I'm sitting with him, I'm a month and a half close to two months sober. That's the first time that's happened since I was 14 or 15 years old. That is a shock to the system. Everything's raw. They've taken away my medication, and I'm a little quick. And uh, But he wanted to know whether I thought I was powerless. I said, yes, I'm, I know I'm powerless over drugs and alcohol. 38 years later, I think it's everything, don't you? I don't think it's very limited. I've yet to find anything I have any power over. I'm totally powerless over you. I talk to you incessantly about how if you were a little bit different, the two of us would be a hell of a lot happier. And you insist upon living your own life, and it pisses me off at my core, right? So I'm power. I've lost complete control over the geopolitical situation in the world. Look at it. And they never call me from Washington and ask me what I think, you know? So almost four years ago, I shut off the TV news because I wasn't emotionally stable enough to deal with it, you know? I live here. This is where I live. And we should work really diligently to keep it a safe place, a refuge for us, that we can just be here. You know, But I'm powerless over everything. I've yet to find anything I have any power over. And I can't, lack of power is not my dilemma. My real dilemma is I think I have power, and I keep asserting myself, and it just turns to shit. You know, I mean, I just, it's time and time and time again, and I'm starting to get it. I don't think I require any power. Life just seems to be unfolding right in front of me without any input from me whatsoever. Powerlessness is the first pillar of spiritual condition. In any mystical path that you go down, Eastern, Western, Christian, Hindu, whatever it might be, they, all of them, every one of them talks about personal powerlessness, that we are not running the show. Matthew Mitchell talks about grace. Stuff just happens. It just happens. And if I'm paying enough of attention, I can spot it when it happens. If I'm in that frame of mind, it took me a long time to get to that kind of a space. But powerlessness is the first pillar. If I can do that, if I can do the powerless thing, the second step becomes operational. Wilson wrote about this a lot, being open-minded. All you really need to know about God is it's not you. I think that's, that's kind of a funny term. Isn't it true? I think it's true. You know, I, That's all I need to know. And you know what atheists do, people that say they don't believe in God. Like me, when I came in here, I thought I was a very devout atheist. I, could, I had pretty good argument about it, about being a deist, you know, the source of all that. You know, I, I was one of those. What an atheist does is he creates a God and then doesn't believe in it. <laughs> Isn't that true? So sponsors say things like when I tell him that, there's no God. He says, well, I don't believe in the God you don't believe in either. Now, that, that's just confusing, you know. And you, maybe you, I walked out of his house after one of those sessions like that, shaking my head and go, well, <clears throat> this isn't going well. He doesn't seem to be coming over to my side, you know. And uh, I think God, if you want to use that term, is an experience, not a concept. And the argument is around concepts, not about experience. And if you stick around Alcoholics Anonymous long enough, it will come and visit you, and you can label it with whatever makes you feel comfortable. It has visited me. That day on my doorstep was the first little indicator. It was the first moment. And what they've been for me is aha moments, like, oh, it's an understanding that transcends the intellect, isn't it? It's not a thought as much as a feeling. It's an experience, not a concept. It's nothing to really be argued with. So when the third step comes around and this guy comes to me and he's, I said, are you ready to do the third step? And he goes, no. And I go, why? And he says, I have a problem with God. I go, so do I. Let's pray. 
And he's stunned by that. <laughs> then he says, well, I don't even believe in God. I go, well, nobody really does. <laughs> We're all just whistling in the dark, hoping for the best. <laughs> you know. And it says here, pray. I'm going to pray. You want to come? <laughs> you know. I've run out of options. You know. As my sponsor told me, I've resigned from the debating society. And I'm looking for experience, aren't you? I want the experience. And when I'm looking for it, it usually shows up. I had a great experience in Hawaii one time. Matthew knows about this. A lot of people know about this. And uh, I was uh, on interferon. My liver was failing. I was trying to get rid of the hep C, and I had to go lead a men's spiritual retreat in Hawaii. <laughs> and my friend Christoph, who's French, so he's an asshole. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. And uh, he comes over and he hands me the book, The Power of Now. And he says, read this. And I said, I've read that stuff before. He says, God damn it, just read it. Because he saw me circling the drain. This is my friend. Right? He saw me circling the drain. And I read it on the airplane going over there. And Tolly tells this story at the beginning of the book where he talks about being in an apartment up in Vancouver. And he's a nerd, a geeky nerd, and he's highly educated and he's given panic attacks and anxiety attacks. He's just a mess. And he gets up in the middle of the night with a panic attack, and he walks out in his living room, and he looks up at the sky and the ceiling, and he raises his arms up, and he goes, I can't live with myself any longer. You ever felt that? And the very next thought is, well, if I can't live with myself, there must be two of me. I wonder which one is real. Isn't that great? Haven't you struggled with that? I mean, there's, there seems to be something else within me that's watching what's going on. There seems to be a, a struggle going on internally. It's like I heard a guy say one time, you know, I always knew I was a good guy, and I finally am. But there's that turmoil inside, isn't there? I get to Hawaii, and I'm very moved by I read the whole book. I just ate it up, and I read it. And I start talking to these guys about this. I don't know if they got anything out of it, but it sure helped me a lot. You know? And they invited me back, so it couldn't have been that bad. Between one of the, two, one of the sessions that, on a Saturday, I think, I walked up on this little hillside, and there was a little handmade shrine to the Virgin Mary in this church camp we were at, and a little rickety wooden bench. And I sat down on that bench, and I thought to myself, I, even on the airplane, because I'm reading, I, I, I need to meditate with some intent. I need some help. I was physically very sick, and I was a little frightened, you know. And I needed, I knew I couldn't change the situation, but I needed more discipline in the meditation, especially in meditation, to just try to get quiet, try to calm down and not struggle, stop the struggle. So I sat there in meditation. I closed my eyes, and I just breathed to get some deep breaths and oxygen to the brain. And I opened my eyes, and across this little valley, there were these wispy, beautiful trees, and Hawaiian trees. And the wind blew through them, and it wasn't blowing on me. I couldn't feel it. I could only see it. And it blew through the trees like a hand just raked through the grass. And I went, oh, there it is. <laughs> and everything changed. I went back there several times and tried to recreate the experience like any good drug addict would do. You know, we need some more of that, you know. And it, I was very unsuccessful. I think they're one-offs. I think they're one-offs. But I think what happened to me that day is I asked for help, and I got it. Wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but I got it. So the second step is about having an open mind. And I think more importantly, it's about understanding I am not running the show. I should relax into what's happening. Then the third step happens. The third step's interesting. The third step says, I'm going to make a decision to turn my life and will over to clearly what already has it anyway. I think it was nice of them to lead me to believe that I actually have some say in the matter. Well, I've been withholding myself from the totality of all things long enough I'm going to acquiesce now and allow you to take me. Thank you very much. Where's my trophy? Yeah. And we have these windy arguments about the difference between my will and God's will. 
as if that's possible. You know, my little ego, the two-and-a-half-year-old, loves the idea of us having a battle of wills with the power that drives the entire universe, you know? <laughs> really. And we, we wonder, wonder what God's will is. I'm going to answer that for you right now. This will be worth what you paid to come here. You know? God's will is what's happening right now. What else could it possibly be? And I have trouble with what's happening right now. I'm looking for an alternative. And there isn't one. This is it. Right? That's a happy moment, isn't it? <laughs> so what life and will is the third step talking about? It's the inventory, isn't it? The end result of living a life with seeming power, resentment, fears, and broken sexual relationships, harms done to others. That's what I bring to you. That's what I have. The inventory isn't hard to do. It's listing everything and everybody that you hate, and you already do that every night anyway. So all you got to do is write it down, you know. You know, Chris talked about it very well. You know, we do, I, so I do the inventory. I write it down. And I share it with this stranger I hardly know, this God that I don't believe in, and me, who I'm a little confused about now, right? You know? And I do this. And what's the lesson in the inventory process? The second pillar of spiritual condition. I have to stop blaming other people and institutions for my problems. High school is over. It's time for little Bill to take responsibility for his own life. And this is going to take a while. Because I've built up an inventory of hatreds and a whole story around it. So I might be able to get a glimpse of it, but it's not going to happen overnight. You know, and if you surround yourself, I surrounded myself with some relatively healthy people, even guys I was getting sober with. They will help you stop. As a group, if you're together, if you're in that process, you'll help each other stop. And that certainly happened for me. And uh, So then we get to the amends process. You want me to go to these people I'm all pissed off at and say that I'm sorry. I am not doing that. <laughs> you know, It's scary, first off. I mean, I have arguments why I won't, but I'm just scared. I'm afraid. I want to just move on, forget what happened. And one of the beautiful things, as Matthew so clearly defined, that makes Alcoholics Anonymous different from a lot of places is the amends process. We go back and we do the best we can to clean it up. I've talked to a couple of priests that tell me, you guys figured it out. We just have to keep giving them, listening to confession over and over and over, you know. And, uh, and I go do this. And I'll tell you something. When I go to somebody that I don't ever want to see again, and I say the words that need to be said, when I turn and walk away from that experience, I am changed right then and there. No waiting. This is a cathartic experience. This will change me as a person. The experience of doing that will change me. And if you talk to people that have gone through the amends process, that's what you'll hear. They'll express it in their own words. But everything changes then. And what's the lesson in the amends process? The third pillar of spiritual condition, nothing was ever personal. But boy, it sure seemed personal, didn't it? It sure seems like they're plotting against me, like they're focused on me, but they're not. People are just doing what they do, and I happen to be in the blast radius of their behavior. And sometimes you're in my blast radius. I'm not focused on you. You're just the next victim in line. I'm just doing what I do, and I can't help myself, like screaming at the soccer coach, that kind of stuff. I can't stop myself. I'm out of control. So those things that seem so personal aren't personal. When those three things come together, beginning the glimpsing of the power, the depth of the powerlessness, and i got to stop the blaming, and I'm trying. I'm still having big slips, but I get it now. I'm beginning to get it now, and I realize that nothing's personal. Those three things are the collapse of the egoic structure of who I think I am. This is my personality that's imploding. It's falling apart. 
The story, I heard a speaker one time after talking about the amends, he goes, my God, I was so wrong. That's how I felt when I made amends to my father and I started crying and I couldn't stop. And I realized he wasn't trying to hurt me. He's just being who he was. That's a shock. That resentment, it turns inward on me. It's like now I feel stupid. Now I'm beginning to get a glimpse of maybe, maybe I'm wrong. (laughs) Maybe the story I've been telling has not been real. And that's certainly been true for me. So when this happens, I'll tell you something. Self-awareness without humor is depression. (laughs) I mean, you reach a point in this process where you stand there and you go, Oh my God, it's me. (laughs) That's not a happy moment, right? Alcoholics Anonymous does a really good job at helping us laugh at who we think we are. Not who we are, but who we think we are. The persona that we've created that we need to defend and protect. The way the phony biker with the clip on airing. At 10 years sober, I was the phony AA guru. You know, little healthier, but same guy. Stone cold sober. Like when that stuff happens to you, stone cold sober, I blew up my family, I ran off with this girl, she dumped me and I lived, ended up living in the storeroom over my office. Who do you blame? Who do you blame when you're 10 years sober and that happens? Because I'm looking for somebody to help me out with this. I'd like to find somebody to blame. I can't seem to come up with anybody. And by that time, I'd done a lot of work. Now, I was solely motivated that first 10 years. I'm trying to make a name for myself in an anonymous organization. You know how they say, do something good for somebody and don't tell anybody? I don't believe I've ever accomplished that. (laughs) There might be a few that slip through the cracks, and if I find that out, I'll tell you about it later, you know? (laughs) Because I figure if you don't know about it, it didn't really happen. It didn't count, you know? And uh, I'm living in the store, and I'm, I'm hurt, man. I'm hurt bad. I was in as much emotional pain as I've ever been in my life. And uh, I went to my sponsor and I said, I need some help. And uh, he says, go find God. And I said, I don't need mindless platitudes. I need some real practical help. Don't treat me like some wimpy newcomer. And he got up. uh, We were at a spiritual retreat. (laughs) This is true. He got up and he walked over to me and he leaned over me. I was sitting down. And he never yelled at me, but he yelled in my face. He goes, there is nothing else. You talk a good game. Go do it. And I almost hit him. I didn't want to hear that. You know, I'm looking for somebody to blame, and I know there's nobody to blame. I'm angry, and I'm hurt, and I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, all at the same time. And I did a big inventory. And coming out the other, I had a lot of amends to make to people in in AA. But I can tell you this. Even driven by ego even having an impure motivation to do what I was doing, I did it. It did not matter what my motivation was because what happened is I fell in love with you. You can't, when you enter my life, it disrupts everything. It, uh, the plant, you, you're very inconvenient, you know? <laughs> you know? I have to make space for you in my life. And I've done that. Now it's a blessing and a pleasure but at the time, I'm just trying to make a name for myself. He, my sponsor said, don't, don't count how many people you've got you're sponsoring. And I didn't tell him I was counting, you know. But I'm, I'm looking for devotees. I want followers, right? <laughs> so I figure, if I'm going to be here, I want to run it, you know. So uh, this was my motivation. And at 10 years when all that fell apart and the sponsees left and I'm cheating on my, you know, my fall from grace was very public. Very public. Very hurtful. A lot of people were happy to see me fall on my ass. Because I wasn't kind. I was arrogant and I was pushy and I was a preacher. You know? And uh, um, coming out the other side, I was able to begin to laugh at myself. We laugh at who we think we are. And I could see very clearly in that inventory, I'd done the same thing I'd always done. I was trying to be something I wasn't. Because I thought it was cool. Am I going to keep living that way? Well, the fall from that was painful. It took a while. It didn't, it, 
It was painful for a long time. I, I made amends to whole meetings <laughs> just for my arrogance, just the way I acted. And like, I don't have to say words to you to let you know I think you're an idiot. I can roll my eyes and sigh deeply and turn and shake my head and walk away from you in mid-conversation. You know, and I did that kind of stuff. That's the way I treated people. I walked up to a couple of guys and I said, I want to apologize for the way I treated you, the way I spoke to you, and thank you for not punching me in the face. And I meant that. You know, I think I would have done it. Sometimes I'm just too big. And plus, I pick on people that can't really defend themselves. Because that's what a bully is, right? That's what a bully is. Tough guy is something else. Bullies, bullies a punk. And that was who I was. And I don't want to be that guy. Do you want to be like that? I mean, if you run into somebody in your life and they're just a complete asshole, they're just hard to get along with, they're just awful, you can bet they don't want to be like that. They just can't help it. And I couldn't see the truth until I could see it. I had to live through the experience and come out the other side and not run away and own it. And then transformation began. And in the ninth step is when the transformation begins. And the men's process doesn't stop. You know, I have to keep doing it. I wrote out an inventory recently, you know, and, and I didn't have really any resentments, but I had aspects of my nature that I don't care for, ways that I am that I wish were different, and they're not. You know, and I have to turn this over. I have to give it to God, you know. I thought, well, Bill, you know, you sure talk about the steps a lot. Maybe you should work them once in a while, you know. And that was a novel idea, so I put a little group together. We went through an inventory, and we've done it. It's been a really interesting thing to do. <clears throat> 10 and 11, the fourth pillar is self-awareness as compared to self-obsession. Self-awareness, where I realize, oh my God, it's me. In meditation, I can watch myself think. In meditation, I can close my eyes and breathe deeply and focus my mind on the breath coming in and out of my nose. And what will happen is the egoic mind, the thinking mind, the operating mind, doesn't like being in the present moment. There's nothing for it to do. It wants to be in the future or in the past where it can work on stuff. In the present moment, there's never anything wrong. Things are just absolutely as they are. They can't possibly be any other way. And you're in that present, so it doesn't want to be there, and it wanders away. And you notice it has wandered away, and you gently bring it back to the breath. This is a game-changing experience. Evidently, there's a consciousness within me that can watch the other one operate. If there wasn't, I couldn't catch it if there was only one. This is my way of describing it. But there's an awareness about that. I can actually watch. Evidently, I don't have to go where it wants to take me. If it wants to go to the darkness, I can, well, thanks for sharing. I'm just going to move on with my day now. Kind of like that. And that's a real thing. I used to wake up in the middle of the night with anxiety. when I'd sleep not every night, but frequently. One time I took myself to emergency. I thought I was having a heart attack and there was nothing there. I started meditating. When I'd wake up with that anxiety, I would just sit there, lay in bed, and focus my mind on my breath. The next thing I realize, it's the morning. It's not real. It com I don't know why it does what it does, but sometimes it does that. And meditation is a really good tool for exercising that watcher, developing the watcher, giving it a louder voice on the committee. You know, acknowledging the existence of it, trying to be more there than in the egoic part. Now, the mind, we say things here in AA, we say things like, my head is out to get me. We speak about it in the third person. We make it adversarial because that's who we are. It needs to be killed, crushed, destroyed, pounded on, tortured, beaten, and thrown out. You know, it's not the enemy. It's not trying to hurt me. It needs me for transportation. <laughs> right? Why would it kill the host? You know? All it does is take the past and project it into the future over and over and over again. And I don't have to go there, evidently. Sometimes I cave in and I go there. But mostly now, at 20 years sober, I started meditating with some intent, and I really had that real experience. And this is blue-collar kind of spirituality. This is not woo-woo, airy-fairy, go onto a mountaintop and beat yourself with cat of nine tails for th seven years, and then you'll be cool. You know, it's like, it isn't what it is. This is blue-collar stuff. You can sit and do it. Meditation is part of the step. It's not extra credit, right? My, my, 
My sponsor says you can't stay sober on 11 and a half steps, you know. He's quite the meditator, my sponsor. And uh, Matthew's helped me a lot with that, too. So the final pillar of self-awareness is a big one. Self-awareness is a bit the final pillar. The thing that's missing in us that I don't know isn't there because I never had it. I can see the character defects. I'm not stupid. You know, I know that I'm arrogant. I know that I'm pompous. I know I look at these things. I can see that. But I can't see something that never developed in me, that never developed. And what's never developed in me, and many of us, many of my brothers and sisters, is compassion, empathy. I don't have that. My, late, my relationships are arrangements. I'm not capable of being intimate with, with people. And I don't know that. I don't know that's not true. But she stood right in front of me around 10 years sober. This has probably happened to you. See if you identify with this. They express it in different ways. What was said to me is that you are not emotionally available for me. You ever heard that? And I said to her, what the hell are you talking about? You know, there she goes again. Why are they like that? I want to solve problems. She wants to talk about it. She's from Venus. I'm from Mars. And you go buy the book, you know, go into therapy trying to straighten her ass out, you know. I don't believe that anymore. You know what they mean by that when they say that? I've got something that they want, and I'm withholding it. And the truth is worse. I don't have it. And I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it, and I'm helping you look for it. Yeah. And this dance is going to go on forever. And if all I do is go to 875,000 meetings, nothing will ever change. You know, and I'll be standing out in the parking lot with the boys talking about how crazy they are. You know, I don't do that anymore. I go to a men's stag that doesn't believe in that either. Thank God for that. My men's stag is really man school. Teach me how to be a real man. <laughs> Not a gunslinger. You know? And uh, compassion. How do we learn compassion? The mechanism that Alcoholics Anonymous uses in this spiritual path to bring about that, to bring about that growth, sponsorship, working with others. I don't, nothing has changed me more than you in my life. Nothing. Everything else, one through nine is about 10% of the program. It's not even the work. The work is in 10, 11, and 12. It's 90% of the program, you know, and it never stops. It never stops. In my, it never stops. And after a while, my life got big. I had a business to run. Kids are growing up, and I'm coaching soccer and trying not to behave badly. You know, I'm doing the best I can, you know. I was an interesting soccer coach, you know. <laughs> I'd been told that years later. And uh, my life got large, so I couldn't go to 800 meetings a week anymore, right? My sponsor actually sent me home. He says, where do you stay home with your wife and your kids? You know, it's not about living here in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, so I... You know, I did that. But what has kept me around all these years, and I asked my sponsor why we're still here. He says, we've never lost our enthusiasm for it. What's my enthusiasm for it? Speaking at conferences is fun. I'm the center of attention. What's not to like? You know? <laughs> but this is just what I'm talking about. If I'm not doing what I'm talking about, then I don't really have a whole lot to say. One of the fun things about doing these conferences is hanging out with the other speakers, the other zealots, the ones that really believe in it. They're really trying to carry a message, really trying to help. And what do we do? We sponsor guys. We sponsor people all the time. You're always in my house. My wife, Karen, she's 34 years sober. She sponsors a lot of women. I sponsor a lot of guys. We try to keep them separated, given the gene pool. <laughs> She tries to hook him up, so I'm not good, man. She said to me, is Ricky a nice guy? No, Ricky isn't. None of them, Karen. Stop, stop. You know, you know, and uh, that first 10 years motivated by self, right? But I fell in love with you. You invited me into your life. I was there when Matthew Sophie was born. I held her before she, before her, he did. He wanted me there because I'm important to him. You know, 
We're like family. I'm as close to you as I've ever been in my life. I'm not afraid of you anymore. You can't hurt me. Why would you hurt me? I don't have to set up boundaries. If you get too close to me, I'll let you know. <laughs> so, you know if you try to molest me, I'll hit you. You know, it's like, I'll tell you, whatever prejudice you have will walk across the room and ask you for help. Right? And if you want to hang on to the prejudice, if you want to hang on to that, send it away. And you can hang on to your prejudging. Right? So years ago, this guy walked across the room and he asked me to sponsor him. He says, but I think I should tell you that I'm gay. I said, well, wouldn't you rather have a gay sponsor? He says, no. He says, I got the gay thing down pretty good. <laughs> Alcoholism's kicking my ass. You know? <laughs> this is a true story. I stood there and I thought to myself, I am going to remember this forever. <laughs> you know? And we got close. You know? I helped him. You know, you, you've, you've made my life so much larger. I lived in Los Angeles all my life. I'd never been to Skid Row. I didn't go down to Compton. I didn't go down to South Central. That's where those people are, right? I joined AA. I'm down there all the time. It's like, whoa, we're going to go to Skid Row. And I went, no. The most spiritual thing you'll hear in Alcoholics Anonymous, get in the car. I got in the car. My life's never been the same. You entered my life. It's never been the same. And it continues to change because you're always there. You always call. I'm dying from liver disease. You call up and you say, how you doing, Bill? And I start to tell you and you interrupt me and talk about yourself. <laughs> I went from self-pity to resentment. A definite positive move. Right? And... Uh, and I'm run over. I, I want to leave you with this thought. This has been a wonderful weekend. Thank you to all the speakers, how much I've learned from you over the years, you know, is sitting listening to you. They say you got to give it away to keep it. No. You have to give it away to get it. That's how you get it. Thank you.